everybody. It is Nurse Mo, and welcome back to the Straight A Nursing Podcast. This is episode 82, and today we're going to be going through a head-to-toe assessment. But before we jump into that, it is time for our listener shout-out. And today, that shout-out goes to Savi. I hope I'm saying your name correctly. If I didn't, please email me so that I can correct myself. And Savi writes, thanks a lot. I really like this podcast. I started my first nursing job in Australia, but had good experiences in nursing back in India. There was always a little fear inside to speak up, but your podcast gave me encouragement and inspiration to stand up for myself with confidence. Thank you. Savi, I want to say thank you right back to you. Thank you so much for your kind words and for standing up for your patience because that ultimately is what our main job is. Okay, so many of you in my Facebook group um, have been really struggling with head-to-toe assessments. And when I asked you guys what topics you needed help with, this is what you said. Unfortunately, by the time this podcast airs, You'll probably be on your winter break, but you will still need to know head-to-toe assessment for next semester. But for those of you coming in like first semester, you will need to learn how to do a head-to-toe assessment as part of your, probably part of your fundamentals class. I had a separate adult assessment class, but some schools combine assessment class in with their fundamentals course. Regardless, you will have to most likely get checked off on performing this assessment in front of your instructors before you will pass this course. And it's a lot of information, and we're going to go through all of it here so that maybe when you're out walking, or driving or practicing an assessment on somebody, you can listen for me talking through it as you practice. That would be a great idea. So one of the things that I want to tell you, a lot of people are even just asking, how do I prepare for this skills checkoff on doing a head-to-toe assessment? And what I would say is, is if your school has given you a list, here are the things that are part of your head-to-toe assessment. I want you to take that list. I want you to print out a couple of copies. And then I want you to get some volunteers. Now, these can be other nursing students that you're in school with, or it could be your friends and family. They don't have to be nursing students. You're going to take that list. You're going to Talk them through the whole list. So in essence, as you're doing that, you're teaching it to them. And I have always said that teaching material is one of the absolute best ways to learn it yourself. So you're going to go through it with them, tell them what all the elements are and what you're looking for, what your instructors are looking for. And then you're going to have one person be the observer with your list and the other person be your patient. And you're going to go through your head to toe assessment. Here's how I want you to do it though. I want you to start with one body system or one part of the assessment, and just do that over and over until you get it perfect. So start with the head. Do just that section until you can do it without missing anything on your check-off sheet on your list. So then move on to the next part and the next part and the next part. And when you've done each individually perfectly, and this might take a few hours, a few days, a couple weeks. I don't know. It depends. But however long it takes you, get it done and then start going through the whole head to toe with your observer and your patient. And if you're in a group of other students, you can all take turns being the observer and the patient and you will be surprised at how much you learn from being in those other roles as well. So that is an excellent way to study and rehearse for your head to toe assessment. And when I say rehearse, I mean rehearse. Say the words that you're going to say to your patient and your skills check off. Wash your hands. Put on your gloves if you're doing that. Do everything. Don't just say, now I would listen to his lungs. I want you to get out your stethoscope and do it and put your stethoscope in the right spots and have the patient breathe and do all of that. Actually rehearse it, okay? All right, so that's how you're gonna study, but what are you going to study? So I'm gonna talk you through what I had to learn as a student for a head-to-toe assessment. Of course, your school may have different order of things, 
maybe even different things they add, maybe things that they don't have that I have on my list. As always, defer to your school, your facility for things like this. But this should give you a general idea of a basic head to toe assessment. We're not going to dive deep into olfactory nerves and super specific system assessments. We're going to do a general head to toe. Okay, so are you ready? All right, so before you begin, you're going to wash your hands, do your hand hygiene. I want you to rehearse this. You could get through your whole head to toe assessment and fail it because you forgot to do hand hygiene at the beginning. So do your hand hygiene, introduce yourself, tell the patient why you're there and what you're going to be doing. And then you want to get the bed up to a height that is comfortable for you. Very important that you save your back. You want to check the patient's name band or have them state their name. And then you want to make sure, first of all, that the patient is not in any acute distress. If they're having trouble breathing or they're writhing about in pain or they're bleeding all over the place, you're not going to be doing your head-to-toe assessment right now. But a quick visual observation, are they in any acute distress? And then I always like to start by asking about pain because if they're in a lot of pain, they're not going to be able to participate in the assessment or have any patience for it. And it's kind of mean to make somebody wait in pain while you're doing your assessment because as a student... Your head-to-toe assessments are going to take a while, and that's fine. You will get much, much, much faster at it as you do it, but when you're a student, I mean, it's not uncommon for it to take 15 or 20 minutes for you to get through a head-to-toe assessment. So always assess for pain first, and that's the location of the pain. Where does it hurt? What is the intensity? Typically, we use that 0 to 10 scale. Most people can use a 0 to 10 scale just fine. 0 is no pain. 10 is the absolute worst pain that you have ever had, and nothing could possibly be worse. I have a friend that I work with, and he is so funny. And we used to work in the ICU together, and now we work in the PACU together, which is great. But I remember him saying to a patient in his very laid-back California way, zero is no pain, 10 is having your arms pulled off. And I just thought that was hilarious. The quality of the pain, uh, patients will sometimes be able to give you the quality of the pain without prompting, like they may say, it's burning, it's stabbing. That's very uh, specific, but they may need they may need a little help. You might have to say, is it throbbing? Is it dull? Is it sharp? Is it stabbing? Is it burning? Things like that, just to help them kind of describe their pain. And then you want to ask if it radiates anywhere. I have pain in my leg that radiates up to my back, okay? And then how long has it been hurting? Um, They will probably say always because patients in the hospital just seem to be always in pain. And then you want to ask them what helps it and what makes it worse. So if they say, it hurts when I take a deep breath, that's one thing. If they say, um, I just need to lay on my side and it'll go away, then that's, you know, a relieving factor. So that's your basic pain assessment. I like to get that done first because if there's something I can do to help them pain-wise, I want to do that before I get into the full head-to-toe assessment for the most part. Okay, so let's start at the head. You're checking, you're looking at their face, you're checking their skin, you're looking at the skin color, the moisture, the temperature. And you'll do this skin assessment throughout the whole head to toe, but I just like to start it by looking at their face. Normal is warm, dry, and no discoloration. You may hear warm, dry colors uh, appropriate for race. Back in the day, we used to say warm, pink, and dry. Well, not everybody is pink. I can't believe it took people this long to figure that out. So now we say no discoloration or color appropriate for race because there's lots of beautiful skin tones out there and we want to be inclusive of everyone. So we are saying that uh, the skin, what color it is, if it's warm, if it's cool, that's usually an abnormal sign. If it's anything but dry, that's abnormal. Uh, Dusky skin would be abnormal. Jaundice or diaphoresis, clammy, things like that, hot, um, flushed, things like that. Then you're going to look for a facial droop. This would be just a quick assessment of um, their neurological status. Have them smile, see if there's a facial droop. Look at their eyes, is one droopy and one not? Look for periorbital edema, so that would be edema around the eyes, 
This is caused by a lot of different things. Some of the more common ones would be nephrotic syndrome, thyroid disease, even a blocked tear duct. So lots of reasons. It's abnormal, so you would want to make note of it if it was there. And then for the pupils, you may hear people say perla. That means we're looking for pupils to be equal, round, reactive to light, and accommodation. So equal pupils, you look at them, they should both be the same size. When you shine a light, you want to see that they react to the light. That pupil is going to constrict, and it will constrict briskly in a normal healthy person with nothing else going on a little more sluggishly perhaps if they've got some drugs on board maybe some drugs that we've given them and then they can be non-reactive in neurological injury they can also be uh, you want to assess the size of the pupils and most pupilometers or little not pupilometers that's a whole other thing um, pen lights have a little gauge on the side and you can look Note that if the patient's on opioids, they can often have pinpoint pupils. So you want to just make note of that and then maybe come back later when they're not on so many opioids and assess their pupils again because it's really hard to see the reactivity when they are uh, pinpoint with maybe say they're on a fentanyl drip because they're intubated or something like that. And then the shape, they should be perfectly round. Sometimes patients have abnormal uh, shaped pupils because they have had eye surgery. So you would assess for that. And then we talked about the light reaction and the accommodation. So accommodation is the eye's ability to see things both far away and close up. So you could hold your pen, you know, I don't know, a foot away or so, 16 inches, and then look at their pupils and then pull, move the pen in closer. And the uh, pupil should react to refocus on that close up object. So if they don't, that is an abnormal finding. So looking at the eyes themselves, you want to assess the sclera for any discoloration any redness, any yellowness, which would be icterus, uh, which is a sign of ja jaundice. And you also want to assess their level of consciousness. That's typically the first thing I assess is just how, uh, because you've got to wake them up if they're asleep to look at their eyes. So the level of consciousness, you know, Ideally, they're awake and alert, but maybe it's the middle of the night and they're sleepy or they've been given some IV fentanyl and now they're drowsy. So somnolent would be drowsy, but easily arousable. Lethargic would be that patient that's difficult to wake, difficult to rouse, but they'll follow simple commands like squeeze my hand, um, maybe just one at a time. They won't follow like a series of commands. And then a stupor would be a patient that only rouses to painful stimulus, which could be that sternal rub, uh, a that kind of uh, grip at the trapezius muscle that's not very comfortable or the pen across the nail bed, which is the most painful. And then comatose would be the patient that doesn't respond to any of those awful, painful uh, stimuli. Orientation, you want to ask the patient who they are, where they are, and all of that. So name, date, location, and do they know why they're here? So honestly, guys, how often do you know the exact date? I often don't. I'm pretty sassy if I know what day of the week it is, but I definitely know the month. So if a patient doesn't know the date, I'll ask them, do they know what day of the week? Uh, if they don't know what day of the week, I'll ask what month. And then that typically, for me, is enough for orientation if they kind of have a ballpark. The hard part is if they've been in the hospital you know, they came in last night unconscious, and now they're just not even sure what day it is. Yes, they are disoriented, but they can be reoriented. Um, and then you can check back later. And if they still know what day it is, because you talked about it earlier, they're oriented. And then you want to, I always ask, do you know why you're here? Because a lot of times people are not oriented to their situation. So ask them, why are you here? And they will tell you. Sometimes they can't tell me the name for the place that they are. Uh, they're very confused, especially in the intensive care unit. So um, just to make sure they don't have like a word finding problem, some people have difficulty with that because, you know, maybe they've had um, a stroke or something in the past that I don't know about yet. I'll say, is this a post office or a hospital? Or is this a grocery store or a hospital? And see if they can figure it out from that. But anyway, that's orientation. And then you look at their neck. Um, you're looking for... Any retractions of those muscles of the neck with their breathing, that would indicate some form of respiratory distress. And it's also a good time to look at their neck veins to see if they are distended, which can happen in right heart failure, pulmonary hypertension, and a few other things.
Also check for any cough. Um, are they coughing up sputum? If they do, lucky you, you get to look at it. Or if they're not right now, ask them to describe it. You want to know the color, how uh, the consistency, is it thick or thin, how much there is, etc. If there's an NG tube in place, check its placement. So NG tubes will typically be marked at the level that they should be at. So you should be able to see a mark on the, the tube itself. If you don't see the mark, you can look in the chart to see when it was inserted and out to what length it was inserted and then make sure that that's where it is. And if you don't know what I'm talking about yet, don't worry, you'll learn this in first semester. The NG tubes that go into the nose and down into the stomach have numbers on them so that you know um, how far in they are because you don't want that moving around. Uh, a lot of hospitals are now using, I think it's called a bridle. We use them at my hospital, but now that I think about it, I'm not sure what they're called, but I think it's called a bridle. And it's this really cool contraption that takes... Um, it kind of ties the NG tube, not the tube itself, but there's a little attachment and then it goes around the bone inside there. And so if they pull on it, it's really painful. It will break free, but it's uncomfortable. So really pulls down on the um, or decreases the amount of patients that pull their NG tubes out or them just getting dislodged in the first place. So NG tube, you want to check for a placement. Check that it's secure. You know, that bridle keeps it secure. Other times it's taped to the nose. Um, patients that are oily skinned, that tape can come loose. So you want to, this is a great time to re, uh, reinforce that. And you can assess for patency with it as well. Sometimes NG tubes are just to low wall suction. Um, other times they are to feeding. But with both, you want to make sure that it is patent and you can do that with some... Um, flushing some sterile water down there or um, even just some air if it's to low wall suction, especially if there's a lot of gunk in the line and that can just kind of help clear the line and then the low wall suction just pulls that air right back out. So it shouldn't cause any uh, abdominal distension. And then you're looking at um, O2. If they've got O2 on, a lot of times it'll be a nasal cannula. And those can actually cause a lot of skin breakdown. So your professors are going to emphasize that quite a bit. So you want to look for skin breakdown at the ears, at the cheekbones, and at the nares. So those are the three key points where those cannulas place pressure. You also want to make sure that they're in the right position. You would be surprised at how many times you'll walk in and it'll be pulled over to the side. And you'll want, oh, that's why his oxygen level is only 85. Well, let's get that back in place. And then you want to make sure that the oxygen is actually on and on at the rate that it should be or that it was last charted at, the, uh, indicating that that's what the patient needs right now. So um, that's basically what you're going to be looking at with the head, okay? So level of consciousness, look at their skin, look for a droop, look for periorbital edema, check their pupils, look at their eyes, um, orientation, their neck, are they coughing anything up? How's their NG tube? How's their oxygen device? Okay, so there's the head, basically. Okay, then we're going to go to the arms and hands. That's what I like to do next. I like to get a good hand grip just to check quickly for musculoskeletal strength or possible neurodeficit. You want purposeful movement, uh, patient following commands and doing things purposefully. Check for those radial pulses. Check on both sides. Just you want it to be equal on both sides. A strong pulse that's regular in rhythm is what you're looking for. Take a look at the nail beds for uh, capillary refill, you do that little compression and you hold down for a moment and then you release and it should turn back to that baseline color within three seconds and that's normal for capillary refill more than that and it's considered delayed cap refill which is a sign of hypoperfusion maybe the patient has um, some decreased cardiac output issues maybe some peripheral vascular disease could be uh, all kinds of reasons you want to check if they've got an IV which most of them should is it patent are there signs of infiltration or phlebitis phlebitis 
would be redness, tender, warm to the touch, probably the patient complaining of pain when you check patency. Infiltration would be edema, possibly cool because the skin around the site is filling up with IV fluid, basically. Hopefully IV fluid and not vancomycin. And then there could be some fluid leaking around the site. Could also be uncomfortable for the patient as well. If they've got a pick line in place, you just want to make sure that that dressing is intact. Specialized nurses typically take care of the pick line dressings, but if you notice that it's loose, you would want to call them right away. And then pick lines place the patient at high risk for a DVT in uh, the arm veins. So you would want to assess for those uh, any edema or that arm being a bigger size, maybe red, swollen looking, check for that. Checking for skin turgor tells us about our patient's hydration status. A quick return to original state is what you're looking for, and you can just do that by pulling up on skin on the back of the hand and then releasing it, and it should spring back to place. Though in the elderly patients, it will not spring back as much just because the skin loses elasticity as we age. And then if the patient has an AV fistula, if they are a dialysis patient, you want to check that fistula for a brewy and a thrill. So a brewy is that whoosh whoosh sound that you can hear with your stethoscope when you place it over the site. And then the brewy, I'm sorry, the thrill is what you feel. So you feel a thrill and it feels like a cat purr. Okay, so you want to check that if they have an AV fistula situation because they are on dialysis. Okay, so now let's move to the chest and look at our cardiac and our respiratory. So start off, I like to start off, I usually listen to lungs first. We're going to talk about heart first, uh, but I listen to lungs first just because my habit was in the medical ICU where I worked. Most of my patients were there um, for a lung issue and not a cardiac issue, but um on my school's checkoff sheet, it was cardiac first, so that's how I'm going to present it to you. So listening to heart sounds at the apex, you're listening for that S1, that S2, nice clarity, not muffled, not distant, hopefully no murmurs or additional heart sounds, which if you haven't learned about S3 and S4 yet, don't worry about it. You will learn and you will learn that they are abnormal. Uh, murmurs sound kind of like a whooshing sound with each beat. Um, normally the S1 and S2, that lub-dub, is pretty distinct. You've all laid on someone's chest probably and heard a heartbeat even if you haven't started nursing school yet, so you know what that sounds like. Imagine it having a bit of a whoosh to it, and that is what a murmur sounds like. And then just as a reminder, the apex is at the left chest, mid-clavicular line at the fourth to fifth intercostal space is where you're going to be listening for that for those heart sounds. And then you can check for an apical radial pulse. You're looking for a pulse deficit when you do this. And this will typically be ordered by the MD. But just so you know what it is, it's carried out by two nurses at the same time. So one is listening at the apex and counting for a full minute. And one is checking a pulse at the radial artery and counting for the same full minute. And ideally, the numbers are the same. Okay, so that is what you're looking for there. If your radial pulse is lower than your apical pulse, it is said that the patient has a pulse deficit. And that would definitely be an abnormal finding that you would want to let somebody know about. Now let's move on to the lungs. And you'll be listening to the lungs at the anterior, the lateral, and the posterior. I find that I like to listen to the posterior first because if the patient is going to have crackles, you'll hear them most likely in the posterior bases. And you'll find that as you do your lung assessment and they're taking those deep breaths, the crackles may disappear. But if they were there in the first place, it's nice to know that they were there. So... If you start at the back, you want to start at the bottom, listening to their lung sounds. And that would be like just around the bottom of the ribs, just above the bottom of the ribs for those lower lung sounds. And then just below the scapula, remember, you're not going to hear anything through bone, so don't try to listen to lung sounds through scapula or just, you know, inward of the scapula a little bit. And then for your upper posterior, you know, right there um, above the scapula, more or less. So listening to the posterior lung sounds, if you start at the bottom, you may catch crackles that could clear as the patient continues to take those nice 
deep breaths. So the way you do this is you instruct the patient to breathe in and out through their mouth. You want them to breathe deeply. You don't want them to hyperventilate. So they don't need to rush and hurry. They will be taking full breaths in and you will be listening one side and then the other. So you would listen right, left on the lower, then right, left, middle, and then right, left, upper, so that you can compare side to side. Okay, and then you can listen to the anterior lungs. So you're going to start the right below the clavicles is where you would hear wheezes in a patient with COPD. Oftentimes those wheezes are just kind of up towards the top. So don't miss listening right below the clavicles. And then that top one third of the sternum would be another site that you'd want to listen. And then again, just above the bottom of the ribs. And then for the lateral right below the axilla on both sides. And then don't forget to go down a bit for that extra lobe on the right side. So that's how you're going to listen to your lung sounds. So when you're looking at respirations, you want to assess the rate, the rhythm, the depth, the presence of air movement. So rate, rhythm, depth, presence of air movement. If you can remember RRDP, maybe that will help you. So rate, you're just counting. I like to count for at least 30 seconds. 15 seconds, you could still have some variability with that um, just because multiplying, say you count four breaths in 15 seconds versus five, well, that's the difference between a rate of 16 or 20, which is a lot of variability. So I like to go for 30 seconds when I'm counting the rate. And here's a tip, don't tell the patient you're counting their respirations because they will alter their breathing. I swear they'll breathe like more calmly and more deeply. So I count their respirations while I pretend to take their pulse. Okay, so that's a little tip there. The rhythm you're looking for, regular rhythm, no um, variations in their breathing pattern. You're looking for depth. You want nice deep breaths. Um, shallow breathing would be a sign that maybe they're in pain. Maybe they're in acidosis. There could be something else going on. And then that presence of air movement, you've already done that because you've been listening with your stethoscope. But those are the key things. And then you'll identify any abnormal lung sounds with that. If they've got an incentive spirometer, you want to have them do that. You want to see what level they're getting and provide instruction if they're doing it wrong, like if they're blowing out instead of breathing in or hyperventilating or whatever. Have them do their incentive spirometer and instruct them that it's 10 times an hour while awake, which is, you know, we tell patients in the hospital if they're watching TV because there's just nothing else to do there. When a commercial comes on, do your 10 um, incentive spirometer exercises. You will also be looking at their work of breathing. You started that when you looked at the neck to check for the muscles of the neck. You also want to check for are the muscles of the chest wall look like they're retracting? Um, does the patient look like they're struggling and working really hard to breathe? And then if the patient has a chest tube in place or a central line at the subclavian or the internal jugular, both of those high risk for uh, pneumothorax. So check for crepitus um, around that insertion site and see if you notice any. Okay, so that is the heart and the lungs. We're listening to sounds with the heart. We're checking that apical and the radial pulse. And with the lungs, we're listening side to side, front and back and laterally. And we're checking for RRDP, which is rate, rhythm, depth, and presence of air movement. And we're going to have them do the IS. We'll make sure they're not having any respiratory distress with their work of breathing. And check for subcutaneous emphysema, also known as crepitus, if they have any cause to have that. Okay, let's move on to the abdomen. So with the abdomen... The way I learned it was to look, listen, and then feel. That way you're not 
disrupting the natural bowel patterns with your palpation and getting an abnormal hyperactivity with your bowel sounds. So if you look first, you're not disturbing anything, then you listen, and then you feel. So when you look at the abdomen, if the patient can lie flat, that's the best way to assess their abdominal contour, I guess. You know, it could be flat, it could be distended, which looks at about five months pregnant-ish, um, rounded, concave, etc. So you want to look at the way their abdomen looks if it's flat, rounded, distended, etc. Then you listen to their bowel sounds. So if the bowel sounds occur more frequently than every five seconds, this is hyperactivity. And then if it's less frequently than 15 seconds per sound, that's considered hypoactive. And if you really wanted to say there were no bowel sounds, you have to listen for two minutes. So imagine listening for two minutes in each quadrant. So there's four quadrants and you're going to listen to bowel sounds in all four quadrants. And they could be hypoactive in one spot and hyperactive in another. Usually if they're hyperactive, they're hyperactive all over and ditto for hypoactive, but you just have to check all the areas. And then the other thing I was going to say about bowel sounds was that they can be very high pitched. They're typically more high pitched sounds. So if you're listening for those hypoactive sounds that seem few and far between, kind of put your attention towards picking up on high pitched sounds. And then when they're hyperactive, it seems like that's when you get that rumbling, more deeply toned um, bowel sound that you can often hear without a stethoscope sometimes. Um, if you hear a brewy, remember we talked about brewies with the AV fistulas. If you hear one of those in the abdomen, that could be a sign of something abnormal like an aortic aneurysm or renal stenosis or some other things, but it's definitely abnormal and you would want to make sure that somebody besides you knows about it. And then if the patient is on, um, has an NG tube hooked up to low wall suction, remember we talked about that a moment ago when we were doing the head assessment, that low wall suction is going to cause noise in the uh, in the belly. So turn that off for a few minutes before you start the assessment. So if you turn it off when you're doing the head or the chest assessment, by the time you get to the belly, is, everything should have calmed down. So then you can listen and get a true sense of what their abdominal sounds are. You want to then feel. So we're going to palpate the abdomen for tenderness, for softness or firmness, and rigidity. So try to push down about one centimeter. You don't have to go on a you know a huge mission to uh, palpate their spleen, but just palpate for tenderness. See if it's soft. It can be firm, and then it can be rigid. So a rigid abdomen with pain upon palpation would be very worrisome for peritonitis. So that would be an abnormal and critical finding that you would want to share with someone. You want to ask the patient if they're passing gas, when their last bowel movement was, ask about their appetite and if they have any nausea. So those are the main things with the abdomen. Remember, look, listen, and then feel. Okay, let's go to the renal system. So if the patient has a Foley catheter in place, you want to make sure that it's patent. You want to make sure that all of your infection control things are in place, like it's not hitting the floor because the bed is so low, or it's not above you know, um, the level of the patient. You want it below the level of the patient so that the urine runs down. Some Foley catheters can get a little clogged or malpositioned, especially if the patient has sediment in their urine. So if you don't see a lot of urine in the Foley catheter collection bag and the patient is complaining of fullness in their bladder, or even if they're not, I like to kind of move it around gently a little bit and see if I can get some flow. And and sometimes you'd be surprised at how much flow you can get um, from that. You wouldn't want to cause any kind of, uh, you know, over distension of their bladder, urine backing up into the kidneys causing any any problems there. So check the catheter patency always and make sure that your infection control uh, protocols are in place. You want to assess the urine's color. It's uh, straw or pale, clear, um, yellow, amber, cola-colored, or blood-tinged. It could be cloudy or clear. It can have sediment. It can have clots. It can have mucus. It can have 
things in it. Um, you want to be able to describe that in your charting. And then if the patient is voiding, ask about burning, urgency, how much they're voiding, you know, if they're urgent burning and voiding, you know, teaspoon at a time, they probably have a UTI. So you want to uh, definitely let somebody know about that. Okay, so that's it for the renal system. And then we can move on to the legs. So with the legs, you know, the patient might have their socks on, their scuds on, their sequential compression devices, their TED hose. Take that stuff off so you can really see what you're doing. I know TED hose are a pain in the neck to get back on, but if you're going to be thorough, you're taking them off off. Um, a key tip before you touch a patient with diabetic neuropathy or any neuropathy on their feet, especially where the neuropathy can be really bad, you want to ask them how sensitive their feet are because you don't want to cause them any pain. You would want to be extra gentle with those patients. So you'll be checking the pedal pulses. That's the um, dorsalis pedis and the posterior tibial. If the patient has edema, it can make this difficult. Be patient. Um, with yourself. And the more pedal pulses you palpate, the better you will get at it. It was one of the harder pulses to learn how to assess as a student. But the more and more and more you do it on all the different types of people of all shapes and sizes and ages, you will get better at it. I promise if you can't find it with your fingers, you can always get the Doppler and assess it that way. And then sometimes if you get the Doppler and find it, if you mark the spot, then you can go with your fingers and feel it. So that's just a little tip there if you're having any trouble at all. You want to assess for edema. So start at the feet and then go up and you want to, you know, state where the edema ends. So if it goes all the way up to to the thigh or the knee or the, you know, halfway up the leg or whatever. Um, we're looking at pitting edema versus non-pitting edema. So pitting edema is that edema that if you push on it and you take your fingers away, it takes a while for the skin to fill, you know, for that depression to fill back in. You made a pit with your fingers. And that'll be rated, you know, on your charting as one plus or two plus. And it just has to do with how deep of a pit you can make with your fingers. Uh, this is typically due to things like fluid retention, a protein deficiency like in nephrotic syndrome and inflammation. And then non-pitting edema, so you push on it and there's no indentation, but there's edema there. That's usually due to something like lymphedema. Maybe there's a lymphatic obstruction or mixed edema in your patients who have like hypothyroidism. There's probably other issues, but those are probably some of the most common reasons why you'd have non-pitting edema. You want to check the color and the temperature of the feet and the cap refill at the nail beds there. While you're touching their feet through all this, ask them if they can feel you touching um, and if they have any numbness or tingling in their feet. If the patient has diabetes or any peripheral vascular disease, check their feet very carefully for wounds, especially any wounds that look like they're not healing. You'd be surprised at how many diabetic patients get awful ulcers in their feet because they got a little rock in their shoe and didn't feel it and then it just caused a wound and now they've got a giant hole in their foot and it's very sad so you want to check their feet very carefully and in my in my nursing school days we were instructed to check for a Holman sign which is a sign of a, a DVT in the lower extremity I don't really think that's a common practice because some studies suggest that the risk for dislodging a DVT clot outweigh the benefits of assessing for a DVT by performing this home and sign test, but it's basically done by the patient extending their knee, and then you raise the leg up to about 10 degrees and then abruptly dorsiflex the foot and squeeze the calf with the other hand. And if there's a DVT present, it typically causes a fair amount of pain for the patient. So that would be a positive home and sign indicative of a DVT. And then you want to just simply assess dorsiflexion and plantar flexion of the feet. Have them push their feet against your hands in both directions to assess their ankle strength. Okay, so let's move on to the back. So I usually do my back assessment when I'm listening to my lungs, but if you didn't, what you're looking for is dependent edema around the sacrum, the scapula, um, just on their back there. If they've been lying in bed, you want to look for any redness at the bony prominences, scapula, and the tailbone, uh, the sacrum around that area because of skin breakdown associated with immobility. 
And then um, that's about it for the back. So if you do that, when you're listening to the lungs, you've done two things at once, and that's nice. Okay, and then basically you're done with your head-to-toe assessment, but before you leave, you're going to get the patient back into a comfortable position. Okay, you just totally disrupted their flow. You want the bed all the way down to its lowest position. You want to make sure that it's locked. You want the call light available. You want their bedside table where they can reach their things so they don't fall trying to reach something. You want the side rails up if you're using them. I like to always check that the O2 and the suction are functional and that I know where the code button is if I need it. Um, Ask the patient if there's anything else that they need that you can do to help them or if they have any other urgent concerns that they would like addressed. You're going to do your hand hygiene and let the patient know when you'll be back to check on them. And telling the patient, I'll be back in about an hour to check on you, I find really alleviates um, unnecessary call lights because they know you're coming back. They won't just call repeatedly for things if they know, oh, Janie's coming back or uh, Jim is coming back in an hour and I'll just ask him then. So that's just a nice thing to do. Plus, if you tell them you're coming back in an hour, you really have have to do that because you develop trust with your patient when you keep your word. That is very important. Okay, so that is your head to toe little cheat sheet there. I'm going to make you guys, now that I'm going through this and thinking about it, I'm going to make you guys a checkoff list and I'm going to put it on the website for you to download. And this checkoff list you can use if you don't have one from your school, okay? If you have one from your school, use that one because that's what they're grading you on. But if you're winging it, and unfortunately in some nursing programs, you are winging it, then um, you can use my checklist or add to it. Maybe I'll put it as an Excel document. How's this for an idea? I'll put it as an Excel document if I can figure out how to do it, which I'm pretty sure I can. And then that way, if you need to add to it and customize it for your school, you can do that. I think that I will do that. So go to straightanursingstudent.com forward slash podcast 82. And I'll put a link for this um, spreadsheet that you guys can print out and customize for yourselves. It may not be beautiful. I'm not an Excel expert, but it will be a list that you can customize. Okay. So thank you all very much. I'm so glad that you were here with me today and I appreciate you spending your very precious free time with me. And then next week we will be diving into a topic that you've been asking about for a really long time. And that is ventilators. So we're going to do just a basic overview of ventilators and vent settings for the total and complete newbie. Okay, so look forward to that. And I will see you back here next week. Bye for now. This podcast is brought to you by straightanursingstudent.com. Copyright Digital Health Media, LLC. 